Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, um, Carl. It's um, a real pleasure for me to, to be here, and I'm really uh, delighted that um, Carl invited me because it gave me a chance to go back and reread um, Reich, who I read many, many years ago, and um, has been really sort of uh, a, a fascinating adventure for me to really sort of um, reread Reich and read aspects of Reich and things that people had written about him that I hadn't read before and think a little bit ab about how much Reich um, has influenced my, my, my thinking in ways which I was not fully aware of. Um, I first read um, Reich's Listening with the Third Ear when I was an undergraduate. So this was long before I uh, trained as a clinical psychologist and long bef before I went into uh, psychoanalytic training. And um, it was obviously many years before topics such as intersubjectivity, counter-transference, and the subjectivity and internal processes of the analyst became central in psychoanalytic um, writing. Now, in rereading Wright today, it's striking to me what a profound impact his uh, writing had on my own thinking and my developing as uh, a therapist, as an analyst, um, as well as the extent to which Reich anticipated major trends in contemporary psychoanalytic thinking. One general line of contemporary thinking so clearly anticipated by Reich can be found in the writing of theorists such as Theodore Jacobs, Christopher Bolas, Thomas Ogden, and the Italian analyst Antonino Ferro. While there are important differences in the work and style of these authors, I group them together because they all emphasize the importance of ongoing reflection on their own associations while they're working in order to help understand the patient without necessarily disclosing their associations or counter-transference reactions to their patients, although both Jacobs and uh, Bolas do on some occasions. The second group of theorists who represent another extension of Reich's thinking consists of authors um, who are sort of loosely classified as belonging to the relational tradition or the interpersonal relational tradition. So examples would be uh, Stephen Mitchell, Darlene Ehrenberg, Lou, uh, Louis Aaron, and Philip Bromberg, um, as Carl mentioned, uh, Donald, Donald Stern, Jody Davies, and so on. Um, the reason I distinguish uh, this group from the first group is because they tend to place more of an emphasis on the inevitability of the analyst's ongoing participation in ongoing enactments with their patients. Enactments um, are conceptualized as repetitive scenarios played out in the relationship between patients and therapists that reflect the unconscious contributions of both partners personal histories, conflicts, and characteristic ways of relating to others. So these analysts uh, emphasize the importance of unconscious participation in enactments. They also emphasize the importance of developing some understanding of their own contributions to the enactment and of possibly disclosing their counter experience and explicitly acknowledging their own contributions to their patients. Now, Paula Hyman's 1950 paper on countertransference is often acknowledged as an important precursor to the contemporary interest in countertransference and unconscious communication. And Wilfred Bion, who spoke about the importance of approaching each session without memory or desire, is widely acknowledged um, as a seminal influence by many contemporary analysts, including Bolas, Ogden, Farrell and many others, and uh, Beyond's influence, if anything, continues to grow. It's impossible, um, I think as Carl was mentioning, not to be struck by the almost complete absence of any reference to Reich by major contemporary psychoanalytic theorists. Um, all of these analysts whose writing so clearly inhabits some of the same soil so well tilled by Reich in the 1940s and the early 1950s. The virtual absence of reference to Reich in the contemporary literature, given his remarkable prescience, is reminiscent in some respects to the historical marginalization of Sander Ferenczi by the psychoanalytic mainstream. 
a marginalization that began to come to an end in the early 1990s when Ferenczi's clinical diaries were finally published and various psychoanalytic schools, especially the American relational tradition, began to reclaim him as an important ancestor. Now the reasons for Ferenczi's marginalization have been speculated on extensively by many authors, especially Andre Hainal. And although has, there has been some discussion of the reasons for Reich's marginalization, uh, I know that uh, Danny Nobitz, who's here with us today, has written about it, and I think is, is, is currently writing about it, and other people are as well. I don't think this topic has uh, yet received nearly the amount of attention it deserves. But that's not what I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, what I will be focusing on is a brief review of some of Reich's major contributions to our understanding of such themes as unconscious communication between patient and analyst, the analyst's use of his or her own associations as a source of information, and the intersubjective -subject nature of the analytic relationship. I will also explore some of the ways in which these themes have been further elaborated on and extended by contemporary analysts. While Freud's self-analysis is considered a cornerstone in the development of psychoanalysis, his discussion of the analyst's reflections on his or her, or her own internal experience as, of the, of, um, as part of the analytic process is relatively limited and he clearly saw countertransference as an obstacle to analysis needing to be managed or resolved rather than as a valuable source of information. Similarly, Freud's references to the analyst's evenly hovering at uh, attention and the potential role of the analyst's unconscious as an analytic instrument took place relatively early on in his writing, um, 1912 or so, and this um, emphasis is not carried through systematically in Freud's later work. Now Reich, uh, especially in 1948, but earlier as well, uh, perhaps more than any other theorist, attempted to elaborate Freud's thinking on these topics in a comprehensive fashion. Following Freud, he argued for the importance of the analyst not allowing his attention to become attached to any one aspect of the observational field, since this limits his ability to perceive other potentially important data that are not the focus of attention. Further, Reich highlighted the importance of suspending critical judgment in order to allow fleeting impressions to emerge into awareness. Finally, Reich emphasized that it was critical for analysts to turn their attention inwards in order to attend to relevant data emerging from their own unconscious. He argued that many of the more subtle nuances of interpersonal communication are both expressed and perceived at unconscious levels and that only by looking inward and listening with the third ear, an expression he credits Nietzsche for, could the analyst come to really understand his or her patients. Reich emphasized the importance of oscillating back and forth between an internal focus and an external focus. With respect to the internal focus, he provides a variety of clinical examples in which he attends to vague impressions, intuitions, images, associations, and even melodies. With respect to the external focus, Reich emphasizes the importance of subtle details in the patient's manner and style of presentation. To quote Reich, we remember details of another person's dress and the peculiarities of his gestures without recalling them. A number of minor points, an olfactory nuance, a sense of touch while shaking hands, too slightly observed, warmth, clamminess, roughness or smoothness of the skin, the manner in which he glances up or looks. All of this we are not consciously aware, and yet it influences our opinion the minutest movements accompany every process of thought. Muscular twitches in face or hands and movements of the eyes speak to us as well as words. These details, according to Reich, are typically processed at an unconscious level rather than, than at a conscious level, and it is often only by turning our attention inwards that we are able to partially reconstruct what we have been reacting to. In Reich's words, once again, 
The first section or phase of this process begins in the clear daylight of consciousness. Let us call to mind the analytic situation that presents itself to us daily. The subject speaks or is silent and accompanies his speech uh, or silence with speaking gestures. We see the play of his features, the variety of his movements. All of this communicates to us the vital expression of what he is feeling and thinking. It supplies that psychical data which the analyst assimilates unconscious during this phase. This unconscious process, or rather, um, the unconscious process, that is the second phase, is never totally accessible to the analyst. Let me give you some brief clinical examples from Reich. Uh, throughout his writing, Reich provides a variety of different types of examples of ways that he listens with the third ear that vary with respect to style and emphasis. For example, while working with a patient who is constantly complaining about her husband, this patient happens to be the wife of a farmer, Wright becomes aware of the song, Three Blind Mice, running through his mind. He reflects on the meaning of the lyrics. She cuts off their tails with a carver's knife and speculates that there is an emasculating quality to his patient. Or another example, Wright intuits that a young man who is worried that he is responsible for the pregnancy of a married woman who he had a brief affair with is unconsciously concerned that he is sexually inadequate and perhaps impotent. So this is an intuition he has and then he goes back and in a great deal reconstructs both the internal processes and the external cues that may have contributed to his intuitions. Okay, now because of time limitations, I'm not going to uh, give many more examples, but I will provide one extended example from Reich. In this example, a young woman has a consultation session with him to explore going into analysis. She tells Reich about various problems in her life, marriage, social relations, and her professional life. She also informs him that she's consulting with him after terminating with her previous analyst because things weren't working out. In general, Reich's impression of her is that she is intelligent, sincere, friendly, and pleasant. Two days later, the woman calls to make another appointment, and Reich doesn't recognize her name or that she had promised to call. At this point, Reich says to the reader, now I was forced to follow the basic rule, analyst to analyze yourself. Reflecting back, Reich now remembers feeling slightly annoyed during their last session. Why was I annoyed, he asks himself. He remembers having had the impression in their first meeting that the woman's previous analyst may have lost patience with her. Perhaps, he speculates, after she provoked him many times. He then remembers two things the woman had said during the session that, in his words, had unconscious significance of which I had not realized but had nevertheless sensed. He remembers that at the end of the session, she had asked him whether he was willing to take her on as a patient. And he recalls that before he could answer her, she had asked him whether he would, he would advise her to go to another analyst that Reich knows. In response, Reich had suggested that she should go to this other analyst. Reich then remarks, at the time the question had seemed reasonable enough, but looking back, he now remembers the patient looking at him with a leer and a kind of sidelong glance. Now, as he reflects on the episode, he construes her actions in retrospect as, in his words, a provocation of a malicious kind. And he thinks to himself, you do not ask a girl to dance and then wonder out loud whether you would rather dance with another girl. <laughs> now Reich realizes that when he had suggested to her that she should go see this other analyst, he'd been responding in anger. In contemporary terms, he realizes that he is already beginning to participate in an enactment. He thinks about her sidelong glance, and then another memory comes to mind. At some point during the session, the patient had casually mentioned reading an unfavorable review of one of his books in Psychoanalytic Quarterly. <laughs> okay, I could go on uh, quoting Reich, but um, 
basically the point is that this early insight Wright makes is ultimately helpful to him in conceptualizing his patient as having an unconscious masochistic tendency to, to, to provoke, and it also helps him to constructively work with his irritable feelings and to ultimately disembed from the enactment. And now, noting the discrepancy um, in his book between his own human reaction of being annoyed and what was at the time the idealized, of the idealized image of the analyst as neutral and objective, Reich writes, what kind of psychoanalyst, some readers will ask, can feel annoyed or impatient? In this, he says, the much praised calm and the correct side, or he says, let me uh, go back and say, he asks, is this the much praised calm and correct scientific attitude of the analyst? The question is easily answered, he says. The psychoanalyst is a human being like any other and not a god. In fact, he has to be human. How else could he understand other human beings? So here Reich emphasizes the irreducible humanness and subjectivity, and subjectivity of the analyst in a way more common of contemporary psychoanalytic writing than the writing of the 40s and the 50s. By contemporary standards, many of Reich's clinical examples, including the one I have um, just given in some detail, seem somewhat dated or quaint, but it's important to recognize just how radical they were for the times. Now, in the short amount of time I have left, I want to provide two examples of well-known contemporary analysts whose particular ways, actually three examples, whose particular ways of making use of their subjectivity in the analytic relationship represent different extensions of Reich's approach. The first is Thomas Ogden. Ogden is difficult to classify as belonging to any particular analytic school, but he has been influenced extensively by theorists such as Klein, Winnicott, and increasingly by Bion. In fact, Ogden uses Bion's term reverie to refer to the analyst inner associations. Ogden introduces the concept of what he calls the analytic third to account for the informational value of the analyst's fleeting associations, images, and fantasies. According to Ogden, the analytic third is a third subject in the room that is constituted by the joint contributions of patient and analyst. The analyst's inner experience will inevitably be influenced by this analytic third and thus will inevitably say something about both the analyst and the patient. Ogden tends to reconstruct his fleeting moment-by-moment -moment associations to the patient's material in great detail. In many cases, these associations initially seem meaningless or irrelevant to the clinical material at hand. For example, while listening to a patient talking, Ogden finds his attention wandering to a letter sitting on his desk from a colleague in Italy. Um, this letter um, was written by the colleague supposedly about a matter that his colleague had said was delicate and should be kept confidential. Ogden then notices the postage markings on the envelope and he has the fleeting fantasy that this letter was part of a bulk mailing. <laughs> Ogden feels suspicious of the genuine, genuineness and intimacy of the letter and he feels disappointed. At this point, he returns his attention to what his patient is saying. And in this way, he moves back and forth. His attention moves back and forth between his patient and his own reverie. And towards the end of the session, and I won't go into any more detail about this example, he makes an interpretation that is ultimately guided by his reflection of the possible meaning of the link between his own associations and the material that the patient is presenting. Now, what I want to emphasize about Ogden is that while for him, the analytic relationship is intrinsically intersubjective, or to use the uh, Behringer's term, constituted by a bipersonal field, there still seems to be a level at which Ogden sees himself as able to, in some sense, step out of the field sufficiently to be able to understand the patient's contributions to the field without understanding how he may have been influencing the patient. As a point of contrast, I want to briefly consider Philip Bromberg's approach. <clears throat> Philip Bromberg, uh, who Carl mentioned earlier, 
uh, is typically identified with the interpersonal relational tradition. And actually, um, although Carl said that he doesn't mention Reich, Bromberg is one of the few analysts I'm aware of who does reference Reich. He references him in three articles. I actually hadn't noticed this until I started re reading his work carefully to, to, to see if he referenced Reich. Uh, but interestingly, he references him only very briefly, and he references uh, the book Surprise and the Psychoanalyst, and he in particular is interested in Reich's uh, emphasis on the role of being open to, to surprise. So there's no discussion of uh, the third year and so on. Okay, for Bromberg, dissociated aspects of the patient's experience cannot be verbalized. They can only be brought into the room in embodied form. And the only way in which the analyst can come to know the patient's experience is through his participation in the inevitable and ongoing enactments of psychoanalysis. To quote Bromberg uh, from, his ninth, from his 2006 book, the road to the patient's unconscious is created non-linearly by the analyst's own unconscious participation in its construction, even while he thinks he is simply observing it. Analysis, these are my words now, is thus a messy, a messy process, full of struggle and surprises. Unlike Ogden, who reflects on the meaning of his own associations, and yet at some level seems to manage to stay above the fray, Bromberg, like many of the uh, relational analysts, maintains that impasses, crises, and what Bromberg terms potholes in the royal road to the unconscious are inevitable. These potholes take place when the patient's dissociated experience triggers a parallel state of dissociation in the analyst. At these times, the analyst dissociation serves the function of splitting off self-states that are experienced as intolerable or shameful. For example, self as sadistic, self as impotent, or self in despair. In order to work through the impasse, the analyst is forced to confront and acknowledge these dissociated self-states to himself and possibly to the patient as well. And it is only when the analyst can, as Bromberg puts it, wake up um, to the nature of his own participation in the enactment that things can begin to change. And it is from this phrase that the title of his uh, second book, Awakening, Awakening the Dreamer, comes from. To quote Bromberg, the analyst is forced to deal with the patient's experience as something that gradually permeates its way into his soul, despite his theories and logic. Until this happens, from the patient's perspective, the analyst just doesn't get it. Uh, these are my words now. The patient is all alone in his or her pain and despair, and the analyst's attempts to be empathic are experienced as hollow. Now, there are some similarities here between Bromberg's emphasis on the need for the analyst to participate in the enactment in order to actually know the patient's dissociated experience at a felt level and the way in which analysts influenced by Beyond, such as Ogden, conceptualize projective identification as a form of unconscious communication. But there are some very important differences that I won't have time to elaborate on now. Okay, now the writing of Theodore Jacobs, who is the third analyst I'll mention, um, in my mind lies somewhere between the writing of people like Ogden and the writing of um, Philip Bromberg. Jacobs was one of the first analysts to introduce the concept of enactment to the literature. Um, he provides compelling accounts of the way in which the analyst can gain an empathic understanding of the patient's inner struggles by engaging in a type of inner work through which personal memories, emotions, and shifting self-states that are evoked by the patient um, resonate with the patient's inner struggles, and then he reflects on these self-states. There are similarities between the styles of Jacob and Ogden. Both pay extensive attention to personal associations while the patient is speaking, and attempt to make sense of the relevance of these associations to the patient. However, Ogden's reverie often tends to have a fleeting, moment by moment associative, common and everyday, uh, to use the term he uses, 
often quotidian quality to them. In contrast, Jacobs tends to focus on personal memories, often from the different past, and associated feelings um, that are in some way connected with the patient's struggles. And there's a sense in which Jacobs' associations tend to be more self-revealing, more self-revealing, a way in which he comes to know the patient through a form of counter-transference analysis rather than through using his associations to decode the patient's unconscious, which is more of what Ogden and people writing in this genre tend to do. Okay, now where was I? Okay, let me end now. I briefly discussed the approaches of um, Thomas Ogden, Philip Bromberg, and Theodore Jacobs as representatives of three different styles of contemporary psychoanalytic writing that were anticipated in the work of Theodore Reich. Ogden's style of reflecting on his own associations or reverie as a way of understanding the patient is similar in some respects to the approaches of a number of other contemporary analysts, including Christopher Bolas and Antonino Ferro. All are consistent with the threat of Reich's work that emphasizes the potential role of the analyst's unconscious process in decoding the unconscious of the patient. Analysts such as Philip Bromberg, Donald Stern, and Lewis Aaron are all consistent with the thread of Reich's work that emphasizes the centrality of a form of self-analysis, of counter-transference analysis that involves exploring and accepting one's contributions to the analytic process. This thread is in some respects less well-developed in Reich's writing, but it is there. And it was there to some extent in the more extended clinical example I gave you from Reich. Reich consistently emphasizes the importance of what he terms inner truthfulness and moral courage in the analyst. He speaks explicitly about the importance of ongoing self-analysis and devotes more of his writing than virtually any analyst I can think of to a type of confessional self-analysis that can be seen uh, as an extremely important of the type of self-analysis found in Freud's interpretation of dreams. Reich's self-analysis, however, does not, for the most part, take place in the context of, attempts, of his attempts to understand what is being acted between him and the patient. So I think that's a difference between Reich and some of these more contemporary analysts. Um, okay, so let me just conclude by saying that whether or not it's important for us to go back and study Reich more carefully because there are veins in his work that have not yet been fully mined, as fully as they might be, or primarily for historical reasons, and to set the record right is not entirely clear to me at this point. But what is clear to me is that a comprehensive examination of Reich's anticipation of and contributions to contemporary psychoanalytic thinking is long overdue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Safran. Okay. Dr. Otto Kernberg is the past president of the International Psychoanalytical Association. He's director of the Institute for Personality Disorders, training and supervisory analyst at Columbia Psychoanalytic, author of 25 books, and a past recipient of NPAP's Oscar Sternbach Memorial Award. Dr. Kernberg. Thank you very much, Carl, and thank you for the invitation. Appreciate the invitation. Can you hear me well? Yeah, appreciate your invitation and um, the, the invitation, of course, uh, also of the NPAP of the organization, and I congratulate you on this meeting in which, um, as um, Harold Blum already has pointed out, a very important contributor um, from the past has been actualized and uh, as uh, Dr. Safran just uh, demonstrated is really related to contemporary thinking in many ways. Um, I um, am going to uh, present something a little more distant from the 
uh, direct work of um, the Theodor Reich um, uh, corresponding to his uh, enormous interest and contributions to the study of uh, sexuality and um, its uh, relation to unconscious conflict, masochism, and um, eroticism in general. Um, and um, uh, what I wish to present is um, um, a particular way of looking at um, uh, difficulties to um, um, being in love, difficulties um, in sexual loving. So out of the big pathology and normal psychology of the relationship between love and sexuality um, um, is um, the, the broad subject that was announced of love and lust, I want to focus on, on that um, particular restriction. Um, what I'm going to say uh, is illustrated by case material all along, but because of the time restrictions, I've had to leave out all the cases, so you'll have to bear with me in a somewhat dry presentation of a, a general uh, theoretical approach. Um, but um, I hope it's uh, descriptive enough to um, be able to convey my ideas. The methodology followed in this paper is to describe the capacities involved in love relations on the basis of their noticeable absence under various pathological conditions and to use psychoanalytic observations of their lack or absence to construct a composite frame of the corresponding assumed normal functions. Such a structural frame should facilitate an early diagnosis of the main features of pathology of love relations in individual cases. I'm aware of the risk that what follows may be interpreted as, quote, prescriptive, as a prescriptive set of characteristics of normality. It is not. It is intended only to be a set of dimensions, a theoretical ideal frame with a diagnostic potential to highlight, by contrast, major areas of difficulty or pathology in the capacity to love. Um, because the large majority of cases I've been able to analyze have been heterosexual patients, I limit my discussion to the dynamics of heterosexual love. Clearly, a parallel study of homosexual love relations remains to be done. First, falling in love. Obviously, in the state of falling in love, we expect to see a degree of idealization of the other person, an enchantment with the partner's physical, sexual, and personality features, an interest in and respect for the other person's value systems, and an intense longing for sexual intimacy, emotional closeness, and for a meeting of the minds regarding joint ways to experience the world and relate to it. It is a passionate experience. This is in sharp contrast to narcissistic patients' typical market analysis, under quote, of the pros and cons of the potential partner's attributes, to masochistic patients' anxious idealization of their love object with the fantasy that rejection would mean a major devaluation of themselves, and to paranoid patients' fearful attention to not being treated badly or being cheated. The lack of the capacity to fall in love is a characteristic symptom of severely narcissistic personalities. The incapacity to fall in love is an important diagnostic marker for these cases. Necessarily, the initial idealization of falling in love will shift into the awareness of shortcomings in the other and in the relationship and of new aspects of the interaction that have to be incorporated into their image of the other, both good and bad, 
the nature of the idealization of the love object shifts throughout time. Again, narcissistic patients, given their difficulties in establishing object relations in depth, often evince a tendency to repeatedly evolving, crunch and falling in love or infatuations, under quote. They have great difficulty in maintaining a stable love relations. Second, interest in the life project of the other. Here, a central aspect of the capacity to love will emerge, one that may require time to become fully evident, namely an ongoing curiosity and interest in the life of the beloved person, in his, her emotional experience, personal history, ideals and aspirations, as an unending source of stimulation and growth of one's own life experience. The interest in the life and emotional development and growth of the person one loves is a source of personal enrichment and adds a dimension of depth regarding joint exploration of intellectual interests, relations to nature, art, human conflicts, and it further deepens love and gratitude for what the couple shares. It implies the capacity for a mature object relation in depth. The absence of this psychological capability of curiosity and interest in one's partner is one of the most dramatic consequences of narcissistic pathology with its tendency to take the other for granted, boredom with the subjective experience of the other, and the experience of the relationship is more transactional, under quote, than interpersonal, dominated as it is by concern with, quote, who of the two is getting more from the other. And of course, a submersion in the subjective experience of the other necess necessarily may become distorted by excessive projective mechanisms characteristic of paranoid character traits or by a predominantly aggressive infiltration of the relationship related to the destructive pathology of envy, both conscious and unconscious of narcissistic personalities. Third, basic trust. A second characteristic of the capacity for mature love is the presence of a basic trust in the partner's empathy with oneself and the goodwill of the other. A corresponding capacity is the freedom to be open about oneself, including about one's weaknesses, conflicts, and frailties, daring to express one's need for help and understanding, one's doubts in oneself at times of crisis or regarding conflictual aspects of the self, with the implicit trust that the other will understand, tolerate one's uncertainty and sense of frailty, and that love will not be affected negatively by revealing one's vulnerabilities. At the bottom, this capacity implies the internal security in depending on a loving maternal introject, even when edible guilt complicates this deep sense of a secure attachment. Without it, such basic trust remains frail. Honesty may become a major test of the love relation. Of particular importance is the question of infidelity, always a major threat to the love relation, indicating, as it does, a profound conflict in at least one of the members of the couple. Honesty about involvement with a third party poses a serious, serious challenge to trust in the understanding, the tolerance, and the capacity for an authentic forgiveness on the part of the other. To be able to openly acknowledge behavior that hurts the other, accepting one's own responsibility in an honest communication that trusts the other's goodwill, although one cannot be certain of the other's understanding and forgiveness, reflecting the commitment to honesty above the certainty of preservation of the relationship is an indication of such basic trust. It may become a major test of the survival potential of, the, of a love relation. <coughs> Fifth, capacity for authentic forgiveness. The reciprocal capacity not only to ask for forgiveness, 
but to forgive the behavior of the other, to be able to start again after serious conflicts and temporary dominance of aggression over love in the relationship is a major test of mature love. But such a capacity for trust has to be differentiated from the denial of aggression and mistreatment on the part of the other, in other words, from masochistic submission to an unrealistic view of the couple's relationship where trust is not in the other person, but in a fantasized relationship that does not correspond to reality. This latter development usually coincides with an incapacity to really enjoy the personality of the other and to be truly interested in the other's experience. It may be a masochistic submission to and an idealization of an aggressive or abandoning object that usually goes hand in hand with the absence of a realistic assessment in depth and with a remarkable lack of interest in the subjective experience of such a partner. Trust in the other and openness about the self implies the expectation of a mutuality that can survive conflicts and would not therefore be compatible with a lack of response at the same level from the other, except when the effort to maintain a relationship by the other one is based not upon the search for intimacy, but upon the opportunistic criteria regarding the advantages of staying together. That, of course, is a solution not infrequently adopted by couples in conflict, but by the same token, it indicates the limitation of their capacity of a mature love relationship. In this connection, in analytic treatment, there are usually many opportunities for observing a patient's capacity to raise questions when feeling misunderstood, hurt, mistreated by a partner expressing his, her unhappiness over the situation without attempting to induce guilt feelings in the other is another dimension of the capacity for mature love. Communicating one's feelings of being hurt without blaming the other is a subtle but essential quality of open communication that reflects trust in the other person. Quote, I need to tell you how I feel on the basis of what happened because I trust you are not wanting to hurt me and you need to know that this is what I felt, close quote, reflects a very different attitude from, quote, look what you did to me, close quote. All of this does not mean that there is not a place for being enraged and letting the other know that one is enraged with the other, but that in a deep love relation, such a communication would occur in the context of the conviction that one's rage will not affect the basic love of the couple and uh, that the other one knows it. In a deeper sense, the capacity to forgive reflects the achievement of the depressive position, the acknowledgement of one's own aggressive potential and the confidence in repairing a traumatized relationship. Six, humility and gratitude. Mature love, in addition, it seems to me, always contains an element of humility, of deeply felt gratitude for the existence of the other person, for the love received, for the possibility of dependency on the other person, as well as the acceptance of the uncertainty derived from potential future developments in reality that cause changes in the relationship that cannot be predicted. Financial breakdowns, illness, death. Implicit in mature love is an honest acceptance of one's essential need of the other in order to achieve full achieve enjoyment and security in life. And yet, such humility has to be differentiated from a desperate clinging, from an unwillingness to accept the reality of the end of love if, if it should occur unwillingness to accept the suffering of separation as a necessary, essential alternative to maintaining a dependent relationship with somebody who is no longer responding to one's love. Humility may be considered the counterpoint of sexual passion and should be congruent with a realistic self-regard. Seven, a common ego ideal as a joint life project. 
to be dedicated to a love relationship as a life project that infiltrates the task of every day is another major, perhaps the most essential aspect of a love relationship, the counterpart to the capacity for an ongoing, enlivening and exciting interest in the personality and the subjective experience of the other. An ex it is an expression of the joint ego ideal established by the couple throughout time, the basis for ongoing work on the relationship and for the protection of its boundaries and its survival under adversity. The awareness and acceptance of the unavoidability of conflicts, of aggression and discrepancy in daily life arrangements, in sexual experiences and expectations, in the relationship to children and family of origin, in ideology and value systems is part of what makes the life of a couple dangerous yet exciting. Here, an ongoing assessment of one's own essential values is a fundamental, indispensable part of one's personality that must be respected by the other. And what the corresponding basic essential values and requirements are of the other that have to be tolerated and respected and adjusted to is another task and condition of love. The commitment to a joint life based on mature love facilitates the establishment of valuable and gratifying compromise solutions where conflicts and competing agendas arise. Sharing with each other the pleasures the other one gives in such ordinary daily experiences as watching each other in social encounters, observing spontaneous behavior of the other that has an endearing quality, sharing as a source of enjoyment a peculiar, sometimes comical and sometimes moving gesture and reaction, a sudden expression of pleasure of the other, form strong bonds in the union of the couple. Love should permit to open one's eyes to pleasure the other has experienced and has helped us to discover. Love implies sharing meanings we construct on an ongoing basis of life experience and shifting life reality. It is the opposite of a couple taking each other for granted. Frequently, Oedipal guilt, not daring to experience a better marital relation than the one a patient's parents shared in reality or in the patient's fantasy, may be the source of an excessive constraint in mutual enjoyment. A frequent masochistic acting out in long-standing couples is the accusatory statement by one partner, quote, he or she should have remembered this anniversary, been aware that that statement hurts me, know from experience what I want, close quote. Many patients, and not only patients, have to learn that humans are not telepathic. <laughs> Eight, mature dependency is opposed to power dynamics. Mature dependency has to be differentiated from masochistic submission and is closely related to the ongoing sense of gratitude for love received, love not taken for granted, love from the other acknowledged consistently as a gift from destiny or heaven. Love of the other fused with gratitude for the love received also implies a sense of responsibility for the other, for the achievement of the life project, and the happiness of the other as an essential personal goal. One important aspect of the experience of dependency on the other as a component of mature love is the capacity to let oneself be taken care of by the other without suffering from a sense of inferiority, shame, or guilt particularly under conditions of illness and fear arousing experiences. In the case of serious, life-threatening illness or crippling life situations, to be held by the love of the other, not to lose the sense of being part of the couple's living experience, tolerance of one's own and the other's frailty under such conditions, the natural loving commitment to take care of the other is part of the experience of mature love. Once again, profound disturbances in this capacity is closely related to narcissistic conflicts, a sense of humiliation or inferiority when a fantasy independent superiority is challenged and at the bottom, the failure of a safe relation to a loving maternal introject. 
A sense of fair distribution of tasks and responsibility is the opposite to the concern over power distribution in power relations under conditions when aggression infiltrates the love relation and takes the form of the need to protect oneself against real or fantasized aggression from the other. The concern with power struggles as the supposedly unavoidable conflict between men and women represents, I believe, a conventional rationalization of pathological dominance of aggression in a couple's relation in contrast to the normal ambivalence of all relationships that can be absorbed and utilized in the positive functions of a love relation. Psychoanalytic psychotherapy of couples frequently reveals mutual power struggles as dominant themes of chronic marital conflicts. Psychodynamic exploration of such conflicts typically shows dominance of projective mechanisms both in the area of aggressive aspects of ambivalent object relations in their daily interactions and superego derived mutual projections of infantile demands and prohibitions. Conventional cliches regarding the misunderstandings and wars, unquote, between the genders provide easy rationalizations of power struggles. Conflict of who was right and who was wrong the search for culprits, and the identification with sadistic parental images color these interactions. Naturally, a severe paranoid personality structure maximizes the dominance of such mechanisms, but they reflect deep-seated ambivalences, and they are a universal aspect of intimate love relations, as Henry Dix first observed. Revengeful persecution of a disappointing partner for years after the end of a relationship are a frequent development in paranoid personalities. Eight, the permanence of sexual passion. A frequent assertion in the literature dealing with love relations, particularly in its popularized form, states that the initial intensity of sexual desire and erotic passion in the life of a couple is normally replaced by a more tranquil but deeper emotional relationship in which sex becomes less important and a sense of comradeship replaces early idealizations. I have questioned this conventional assumption in earlier work and would only reiterate on the basis of analytic work with patients and with conflicts of couples in later life years that passionate encounters and an intense sexual relationship are a long range aspect of a love relationship that does not necessarily diminish or disappear throughout time. The fact that physiologically, the frequency of desire for sexual relations decreases in the case of men, while it maintains itself relatively stable in the case of women, does not imply the decrease of intensity of meaningfulness of erotic engagement at any stage of life. I do not have the time here to review the corresponding literature and arguments. In essence, Passionate sexual intimacy is a disruption of the boundaries of ordinary reality, a merger into one's own bodily functions, a penetration and being penetrated, a fusion in abandonment and momentary dissolution of the boundaries between self and other. Both Oedipal prohibition and guilt and narcissistic dissociation between tenderness and eroticism play a central role in inhibiting the normal integration of total object relations, polymorphous infantile geni and genital sexuality, and the mature ego ideal of the couple in a total unit. The development of sexual boredom in a long-term lasting relationship is a typical symptom of narcissistic pathology. This is a widespread symptom, particularly exacerbated, of course, is part of the persisting syndrome of separation of idealized, desexualized love objects and devalued but sexually exciting ones, perhaps the most frequent expression of a combination of unresolved Oedipal conflicts and narcissistic pathology. To share the intimacy of one's body is the counterpart to sharing the intimacy about one's emotional life and problems, sharing one's sexual desires and uncertainties in the same way as one's uncertainties, fears, and conflicts regarding competition, jealousy, fin financial uncertainties, threatening family members, 
and conflicts with parents and adult children, the tolerance of the manifestations of aging in, in oneself and the other without any loss of the erotic excitement with the body of the other is a consequence of the dominance of love over aggression, of maintained idealization of the surface of the body in contrast to the unconscious projection of aggression into the body of the other, the early mechanism of the origin of the sense of beauty described by Meltzer. At the bottom, the real unconscious conflict is not between the tender, stable nature of emotional commitment and passionate eroticism, but between love and aggression within both the tender emotional and the passionate sexual realm and within the superego structures involving the ideal of the couple and the persecutory superego features. Nine, acceptance of love, jealousy, and boundary protection. It has been said, quote, if you love it, let it be free, close quote. This applies to the expression of mature love that implies the commitment to love the other person with the acknowledgement that that person is a free agent, that nobody can be forced to love more than is natural, not by coercion, not by raising guilt feelings. It means that in the reciprocity of a love relation, it is reasonable to expect that love and commitment be responded to and that if the loved person is not able to respond to one's love, this has to be accepted, and the mourning process over the end of the relationship be tolerated. It means, in practice, a non-guilt-raising exploration of the difficulties in the relationship, of the experience of having been hurt or attacked, neglected or mistreated by the other, and raising it as a question for exploration and resolution with the expectation that this will be a natural concern of the other person as well. All of this does not imply that under ordinary conditions, aggression should not be available to defend the boundary of the love relationship against intruders. The normal ambivalence of all relationship implies that events of mutual aggression are unavoidable in the course of a life together, but by the same token, the possibility of their clarification and resolution carries with it the possibility of further strengthening and deepening of the relationship. If, however, in that context it emerges that one cannot really expect a loving commitment from the other, there exists a re need to acknowledge that and at the end accept it. To accept the limit or end of the relationship is part of the responsibility to oneself to expect mutuality of commitment in a mature love relation. If the other cannot love us as we love him or her, this must be accepted and with it the end of the relationship. Particularly in cases of triangulations, the invasion of the couple's relationship by a third party, infidelity in the relationship, such a clarification of where the other really stands is essential. There are many reasons for such a shift in sexual and emotional interest of one or both partners to outsiders, from the divergent maturational and developmental processes and changing external circumstances to severe masochistic, narcissistic, or paranoid pathology. Whatever the reason, the exploration of how and whether the love relation will survive requires an exploration of, one can be, of what can be expected from the other and from the self. The possibility of resolution and forgiveness, and if not possible, resignation to the termination of the relationship. The possibility of life together under condition of the end of love may be a psychosocially reasonable compromise, but is profoundly destructive to the basic fulfillments of the aspiration of a gratifying love relationship. In some ways, every long-lasting marital relationship is really several marriages. The resolution of crises changes the nature of the relationship, for better or for worse. Ideally, the resolution of crises may foster growth in the relationship as well in the self-awareness of the partners. When the end of a relationship occurs under conditions of predominance of depressive or par over paranoid mechanisms of, in of interaction, that is with the dominance of sadness and mourning over the loss rather than hatred, frustrations, frustration and wishes for revenge, such a mature way of working through the trauma of separation 
may foster the capacity of a more mature relationship with a new partner. 10, love and, and last, um, love and mourning. A positive development, even under conditions of a deeply painful emotional working through, may follow the death of a beloved partner. As I have pointed out in earlier work, the painful awareness of the full value of a lost love relationship that in all its many valuable aspects can only be fully appreciated after the loss may trigger the development of an increased capacity for love of a new partner by mechanisms of reparation as well as the fulfillment of the ethical mandate derived from the recognition of one's own limitations in the lost relationship. Normal mourning reinforces the capacity for love, while naturally that very capacity signifies a major intensity of the mourning process that follows the loss of such a relationship. In this connection, normal mourning after the loss of a loved one, be it through separation, abandonment, or death, would not be dominated by excessive guilt feelings, self-devaluation, or pervasive insecurity particularly after the end brought about by abandonment from a loved partner, the depth of mourning should be free of self-devaluation in contrast to the characteristic self-depreciation in the case of masochistic and the sense of humiliation in the case of narcissistic pathology. One's capacity to love should function as a major reassurance of one's value. In narcissistic personalities, the unconscious envy of that very capacity in one's partner is a major source of the poisoning of love relations. Separations as a consequence of severe conflict, disappointments or abandonment may provide a time for reflection and search for a new encounter. If both parties are committed to working on themselves and are then able to communicate new understanding and awareness, this separation may be fruitful. A long-lasting stalemate in a, quote, trial separation without any new development in which one or both participants engage in endless prolongation of the status quo usually indicates the loss of love on the part of one of them and bodes poorly for continuing the marriage or the relationship. Uncertain within the relation uncertainty within the relationship needs to be respected within a limit of time when uncertainty cannot be resolved by means of a trial separation and there is a lack of urgency to reach a decision except under conditions of pressure from the other, this is usually an indication of the need to accept the loss and move on with one's life. Such a mature resolution contrasts sharply with masochistic submission to an impossible situation or a narcissistic denial of the possibility that one may be rejected. One's feeling of love for the other, as well as the expectation of an equal commitment of the other as a precondition for maintaining or resuming the relationship, should permit to find a middle road between a naivete based on denial of the reality on the one hand and a, and a paranoid attitude about the partner's motivation of the other. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>